Now, Real Crime looks at the controversial case of Tony Martin. A Norfolk farmer was tonight charged with murder after the shooting of two suspected burglars. The site of the late night shootings, Bleak House, has been the centre of continued police investigation. One of those burglars, Brendan Ferran, told detectives in interview that he and an accomplice, Fred Barris, had been inside when Tony Martin had fired at them. The jury heard Martin had told police he did not shout any warning before firing. He'd even allegedly booby-trapped his own staircase. And he'd told police officers that if burglars came onto his property, he'd blow their heads off. It was a simple burglary that went tragically wrong. The three shots that rang out in this farmhouse saw a 16-year-old boy killed, a middle-aged burglar wounded and a farmer imprisoned. But the shots reverberated far further, provoking a heated national debate that still runs today. How do you define reasonable force when it comes to defending your own home? This was the man who sparked that debate, a reclusive and eccentric loner named Tony Martin. And this is the Norfolk farm he inherited at the age of 35 after spending much of his adult life away at sea. And I know a lot of people said he won't last five minutes because I've got, um, I'm like a rolling stone. I just suddenly thought, well, there is an opportunity here. It's an opportunity, but I like a challenge. The home left to him by his uncle was the appropriately named Bleak House. Standing in 200 acres of land, it offered its new unmarried owner a life of isolation. It's a place that I've visited all my life, ever since I was a child. My mother used to bring me down here. We'd come down here for Christmas. And to me, I thought it was an idyllic um, lifestyle. Idyllic and, some would say, chaotic. Once Tony Martin moved in, the house rapidly fell into disrepair. These pictures of the interior were taken in 1999. I knocked it all around about 20 years ago. Lots of people actually do things and then they wish they hadn't, and then they make a mess of things. Well, I like to do things right. So things take a long time to do. There is a, um, a thing about keeping the, the railings painted white, isn't there? Well, I'm not one of, one of those people. I'm, I'm not really... I don't really worry too much what other people say. I think Tony doesn't understand how normal people live or ordinary people live uh, because he's so used to his own way of life and it doesn't bother him one bit and he's lived on his own all his adult life he can't see that it's absolutely appalling I mean he likes to sleep on the floor he sleeps in his clothes so he wears the clothes day in day out sometimes for weeks when Tony Martin first moved here in the late 1970s, crime was virtually unheard of. But 20 years on, things were very different. Rural police stations had closed, criminal activity had spread from town to countryside, and suddenly the small Norfolk community felt under siege. Everybody keeps themselves to themselves. I'm just fed up of everything getting stolen left, right and centre. If it's not bolted to the ground, it walks. Michelle and Paul Morton know at first hand what it's like to be the victims of a break-in. feel like a victim, like a prisoner in her own home. The break-in can be over in a matter of seconds. Mr and Mrs Johnson have been left shocked and distressed by this burglary. Police are appealing to people not to become a burglary statistic and to protect their homes. By the late 90s, Tony Martin had himself become a statistic. He'd also apparently lost faith in those whose job it was to protect him. He didn't like the way that uh, the police no longer had an interest in um, guarding the community. He was very uptight about the, th the robberies and thefts he's had at his house recently, and particularly so in the last 
year because he had several break-ins and prior to that he'd had lots of um, thefts on his farm, farm machinery, farm tools, etc. Yeah, he was a bit fed up about that, yes. It wasn't just burglars who had upset her son. Some time earlier, he had had a run-in with suspected trespassers on his land. I asked him again, who are you? And he wouldn't tell me. And I said, right, I want you to leave. Anyway, one thing led to another, going to a hell of an argument. And he said, I don't like you. And in the end, I fired at the back wheel of his vehicle, and off he went. As a result of this incident, Tony Martin had his firearms licence revoked. We want to have a go at this man here. By 1999, Norfolk's rural community were starting to fight back. They banded together to form an anti-crime group known as Farm Watch. Among those demanding action from the police was Tony Martin. I first met Tony Martin at uh, a Farm Watch meeting that had been called by the local residents who were deeply concerned about what was happening with the crime patterns in that area. They'd managed to hire a local hall to come along and discuss the way forward, what was happening, and the way that they want to know what Farm Watch suggested in dealing with it. But although the community were getting organised, the local crime wave showed no sign of stopping. In May 1999, Tony Martin was burgled again. At another farm watch meeting shortly afterwards, Martin's frustration boiled over. He was overheard saying, you know the best way to stop them? Shoot the bastards. He added that if a particular team of burglars returned, he'd blow their heads off. It was enough to alarm the group's organiser, a retired police firearms officer. I told Norfolk Police of the interview that I'd had I checked as best I could that he wasn't in possession of a firearm and um, had been reassured by the local population, though, that's just Tony, so he's not the sort of um, person that you would immediately put down as somebody that would go out of his way to shoot anybody. August the 20th, 1999, and in the late afternoon, a team of thieves set off from Newark to burgle Bleak House, some 70 miles away. Their 32-year-old driver, Darren Bark, a professional thief with more than 50 convictions. The 29-year-old gang leader, Brendan Fearon, another convicted criminal with over 30 offences on his record. Both had robbed Tony Martin's farm just three months earlier. But today, joining them for the first time is a 16-year-old boy, Fred Barris. This is Fearon's account of the break-in, taken from later police statements. When Darren had dropped us off, I dropped the torch out from under my jumper and I put my gloves on. We walked along the road onto the gravel to look at this house here. We was going to rob it. I could hear noises and I didn't know what the noise was. I saw a big dog in the middle of the track growling at us and Fred said, it's a dog, it's a dog. Tony Martin's three Rottweilers were loose in the grounds. I was just sitting as though to kick it and it got vicious. Fred shouted, there's another one, and he's holding my shoulder. Before I knew it, it had me back against the wall. I heard a smash. I looked behind and I saw a window. Fred must have hit it with his elbow. I couldn't see nothing, even with my torch. Fell over a couple of times. There was a lot of dust all over the place. Cans, bottles, bricks, wood. I was feeling about for a window or a door and just seeing a load of flashing. A shot in the dark and a shot that would echo throughout Britain. There's somebody outside and they're screaming, they're hurt. We didn't go out. Right. I think he's been shot. You need to come quickly. Been shot? Yes. August the 20th, 1999. 
As burglars were breaking into his farmhouse, Tony Martin lay asleep on his bed. He was fully clothed and an illegal pump-action shotgun rested by his side. I'd gone to sleep. I, I think I'd had a um, um, swig on a bottle of wine. And I was reading the Farmers Weekly, and as you do, once you lay down, you go to sleep. I mean, I knew there were people down there because I heard voices. But I went back into the bedroom. Then I went, I mean, I think it's a natural thing. I went to the furthest point of the bedroom, furthest away from the door. And I stood there and I got visions of people coming through the door. But there wasn't anybody there, but I got visions of what might be coming through. Anyway, I stood at the furthest point behind the bed and I kept on thinking about it. And um, they say it's not possible, but I know it is. I could actually hear my heart beat, you know, like one of these Hitchcock thrillers, and you get this boom, boom, boom. And it is the adrenaline that's pushing through you. And I didn't know what I was going to do. And then I basically, I couldn't hack it anymore. I couldn't stay in that bedroom, but I wasn't going to go downstairs without protecting myself with whatever you might have. As it happened, I had a gun. So I picked up the gun and the rest is history. I went out there and I started going down the staircase and um, they put the torch on me and just a natural, very fast reaction, he pulled the trigger. And that's it. Tony Martin fired into the darkness. And I heard Fred shout. I seen a flash and I heard a noise. My leg felt numb. I seen an old man standing in the stairway. I just went mad and ended up looking for some way to get out. I couldn't get hold of my torch, it was spinning. My arm went through a window, but I just ripped it out. Burglar Brendan Fearon had been hit in the groin and side. With nearly 200 shotgun pellets in his body, he dragged himself across the fields. I was driving along here about half past eleven, just tootling along this road here. There's a chap stood about here in the middle of the road, trying to flag me down. He obviously looked in great pain and distress, but I thought, well, I'm not stopping. I think, well, I didn't quite know what to do. I didn't know to stop or not, but I didn't know him. I didn't know what he was up to. I mean, he could have, him and his mate could have been having a battle, or he could have tried to take the van off me. Heavily bleeding, Fearon staggered into the garden of Tony Martin's neighbours, who immediately called the police. There's somebody outside and they're screaming, they're hurt. We didn't go out. Right. Oh. I think he's been shot. You need to come quickly. Been shot? Yes. And what makes you think he's been shot? Because he's shot and he's been shot. Back at the farmhouse, Tony Martin reflected on what he'd done. It was a very strange event because everything went totally the opposite. You couldn't hear a pin drop. And then I went upstairs and I sat on the bed and I was tired. Whether I was extra tired, what I just experienced. And I thought, shall I go back to sleep? And I thought, you can't do that. Because I didn't really know what had happened. Ah! Me! Me, shot me! So anyway, I picked the gun up. I was going to leave that in the house. Because the type of person that would have come in that house, they, they could easily have come back. They could have still been in the house for all I know. Anyway, I worked my way through the house in the dark. Got outside, I found myself a torch, and then I went back in the house to see what had happened. Then I noticed the window had been pulled out the back of the breakfast room. Tony Martin had no idea when he opened fire that he'd killed someone. So low was his confidence in the police that rather than call them, he decided to drive around this area to see if the burglars were still on his land. Finally, taking his gun with him, he drove to the sanctuary of his elderly mother's house. I didn't know whether anybody was lurking about what I was doing. And then I sort of, I remember when I drove down the driveway, 
uh, could anybody be down there and throw a brick at me in retaliation for pulling the, the trigger? His anxiety continued at his mother's. After a short conversation, he decided to head to a neighbour's. Well, I had a cup of coffee and I said I've had trouble down there. I didn't really want to say anything to her because I didn't really want to upset her. I mean, my mother was, um, was 80 then and she's 19 now. And uh, anyway, I decided to leave the gun in the house because I didn't like the idea of driving around a gun all night, uh, all night with a gun. So I went up to Mrs Lilly and I just kept down there for the night. When burglar Brendan Fearon was picked up and taken to hospital, he didn't tell the police that he had an accomplice. From Fearon's perspective, he was a burglar and had gone on a burgling mission that had gone wrong. And at the point that he got shot, he, he wouldn't have known what had actually happened uh, uh, to his accomplices. So he was, he was obviously trying to sort of um, uh, play for time to make sure that they'd got away. But his account was enough for the police to arrest Tony Martin at his friend Helen Lilly's hotel. It was 6 a.m. and Martin himself still had no idea he'd shot anyone. Well, I was picked up. He said, we're now actually um, questioning somebody, but he's now under sedation. Can you give us your full name and address, please, sir? So at that point, I says to myself, either the guy was terrified of the night when he broke in my house or somebody's been shot. It was a full 17 hours after the shots had been fired when police discovered the body of 16-year-old Fred Barris. Suddenly, the case took on a whole new dimension. Are you aware that the body is It was a murder investigation, um, but it was also a burglar investigation at the same time. Uh, now, that sounds a little bit contradictory, but at a very, very early stage, I had a close working relationship with the Crown Prosecution Service, and it was obvious that in the interest of fairness, we had to follow both separate paths. And the, the death of Fred Barris was treated as a murder investigation, but clearly Tony Martin was a victim at the same time. In the case of Tony Martin, the police had to decide whether, in shooting the two burglars, he had acted with reasonable force while defending his home. Their first stop, the crime scene. Bleak House, as a scene, uh, was absolutely significant because um, in, in terms of um, it being a, a house that was run down, uh, no wallpaper, uh, bare bricks, uh, rats, lack of lighting. Officers began to suspect the house was riddled with traps set specifically to catch burglars. Fairly early on, uh, CPS came to the scene with me at a senior level uh, and it was agreed that the actual house would be treated as a formal exhibit, which I, I think that was probably a first that that's ever been done. Wounded burglar Brendan Fearon was brought back to give his account. There's only Tony Martin, Fearon, who are alive, that were there that can truly say what had actually happened. Come this way, I'm standing here. Yeah, I'm standing right here. And uh, I ate for a chair. Uh, it's got me. His broad... Uh, recollection was that they were in the lounge uh, and there was flashes of light there was no warning no warning shot no warning shouts uh, and that he felt searing pain and they scrambled out the window after they pulled it through um, and he was quite forthcoming with that and and to be totally fair he, he was also quite forthcoming with the fact that you know it was it was a burglary that they intended to do and they'd come down from the newark area to to do it Officers wanted to find the exact point from where the gun was fired. If it was from the top of the stairs, the shots were likely to have been intended as a warning. If it was from close range, the probable intention would have been to maim or kill. Detectives came to their conclusion quickly. The ballistic evidence suggested that the, that the shots were fired from extremely close range. 
the actual wadding out of one of the cartridges was actually uh, either in um, Barrister's body or his, or his genes, which indicated that that was actually fired certainly within the context of fired from within that lounge. The used cartridges that were exited to the right of the gun when his pump action was fired were in a cluster around the fireplace. Plus there was firearms residue on the walls near the window and so forth. So, so all, all the forensic evidence and all the ballistic evidence you know, suggested that that incident had taken place within the lounge and that he couldn't have been at the top of the stairs. With this evidence, the police were able to charge Martin with the murder of Fred Barris, the attempted murder of Brendan Fearon, and the possession of an illegal hand weapon. After three days in police custody, the 54-year-old farmer was brought before King's Lynn Magistrates Court to face two charges. But, during the, ten but the prosecution court, provoked instant public disquiet. If he wasn't there, he wouldn't have been shot. It's as simple as that, as far as I'm concerned. And once they um, trespass on your property, then they uh, run their own risks of whatever happens. The fact that he could be charged with murder seemed beyond possibility. And um, he was very fearful. He said that he, he, his initial reaction was fear, self-preservation and anger. And that... Um, he grabbed his shotgun and, and fired in the darkness. And I don't think he realised the momentum that that would um, instigate. His 16-year-old victim was buried in Newark almost three weeks after the shooting. Family and friends of young Fred Barris are deeply upset by his untimely death. They ask that they be left to bury Fred with dignity and allowed to mourn privately. They are waiting for the true facts to be established and for justice to prevail. Seven months later, on the 19th of April 2000, Tony Martin's trial started at Norwich Crown Court. The crux of the case, what constitutes reasonable force in defending your home? It was a question all the media had seized upon. I mean, the fact is, it was a huge story. Um, you know, one of the big stories of many big stories I've been involved with. With Tony, of course, it was a worldwide interest because even in America, a lot of people had tremendous sympathy for him. You know, the, the usual kind of media frenzy that uh, builds up around a massive case like this, which there was so much um, public interest in and so much public support for him. But in the court, there was at least one group with no sympathy for the defendant. I was there every day during the trial and uh, I was liaising with the uh, family of uh, Fred Barris. It is fair to say that, as with any family, having lost uh, a lad that was only 16, it had a significant effect, you know, and, and, uh, and regardless of what anybody writes or says about them or the case or whatever, it mustn't be forgotten that, that he was a 16-year-old boy uh, and he was dead well before his time. Tony Martin, my client, is a simple gentleman farmer. At the trial, Martin's team argued self-defence, portraying him as a victim of crime. Scared and alone, he'd picked up a gun to protect himself. The prosecution case was that having been disturbed by the burglars, Martin had lain in wait, then shot them at close range with the intention of killing or seriously injuring them. You went out, you held your gun, and you shot a 16-year-old boy. And you shot a 16-year-old boy. Martin's team was headed by Anthony Scrivener, QC. He was very shy, but underneath it all, I thought he was a very decent man. M one of my main concerns at that time was whether or not he would be able to convey his real personality through to the jury, because in a self-defence case, everything really depends on the defendant. On the night in question, he was simply protecting his property. It wasn't until he looked into the detail of the case 
that you suddenly realize there were unusual features here that made it much more difficult. So the going around making these speeches uh, here public, in front of the public, saying he'd kill a burglar on his house way before this ever happened, it made it an unusual case. In fact, no, there was no shout, no, no, no caution. He just shot three shots into the darkness when he knew that someone was nearby. Tony didn't do himself any favours, and I think people found that perhaps the jury found he'd got no compassion for the boy that was shot, but it, that's not necessarily true. I think he had the compassion, but he still couldn't understand why he was in that position facing a jury when in fact they could have come over and killed him and he would be the victim. Martin believed that as he was the victim of crime, the jury would be sympathetic towards his actions, but he was wrong. By a majority of 10 to 2, they convicted him of murder and wounding with intent to endanger life. When the jury returned the verdict, I think he was very distressed. He still thought at the back of his mind that he'd be all right because a jury, English jury, is not going to convict a man who shot a burglar. The police had faced a barrage of criticism for bringing charges against Martin. Tony Martin, the Norfolk farmer who opened fire on two burglars who broke into his isolated farm, was found guilty today of murdering the teenager Fred Ballas. But as he began his sentence, they felt vindicated. Burglary, and in particular the burglary of people's houses, is without doubt one of the most despicable crimes that there is. But I would stress to everybody, it's up to the police and the criminal justice system to resolve it. I was very, very satisfied that professionally as a team um, we'd been vindic vindicated. Um, I think there were certain times uh, during the early part of the trial that because of all the media and public frenzy, um, I had a fear that it almost didn't matter what the evidence was, that, that there, were, there was so much um, view that he was innocent that we're almost having to fight an, up, an uphill battle. But, but clearly, I think that does indicate two things. One is the, the fairness of a Norfolk jury, and the other is actually the strength of the evidence, that despite that prejudice and despite that public sentiment, that we, we still got the evidence home. But was the evidence as conclusive as the jury believed? A year later, Martin was back in court, launching a new bid to overturn their verdict. Jailed for life, Tony Martin came to the Court of Appeal today to begin his bid for freedom. His lawyers say they have important new evidence. This is his one shot at uh, seeing Justice Dunham being released. Ah! Me! Me, shot me! In August 1999, Tony Martin had shot dead a 16-year-old burglar in this remote farmhouse. Although a jury had found him guilty of murder, in the broader court of public opinion, he was being given a far more sympathetic hearing. Many were outraged that a man should be imprisoned for defending his own home. He's got the support of everybody in this area. He did exactly the right thing. Everyone would have done exactly the same in those circumstances. Your house is your castle, and you should be able to protect it the way you want to. Once they're on someone else's property, you know, they should leave their rights behind. Whatever happens to them is a consequence of them invading someone else's property. And the press encouraged the public mood. It was a sensational story. We all know that sensation sells newspapers. So, um, I think that, uh, you know, the media did everything they could to exploit it and to sell copies of papers. But if Martin was to win his freedom, support from the tabloids was not enough. By 2001, a new team of legal experts had rallied to his cause, and in October that year, they formally challenged the murder verdict. Jailed for life, Tony Martin came to the Court of Appeal today to begin his bid for freedom. His lawyers say they have important new evidence. This is his one shot at uh, seeing Justice Dunham being released. There's a long history of him having been burgled. Uh, in fact, the people who burgled him on the night in question had been there before. Uh, he'd been unable to get any useful help from the police, so he knew he was on his own. 
The defence challenged the conviction on three fronts. The ballistic evidence, the significance of conditions inside Bleak House and the state of Tony Martin's mind at the time of the shooting. First, they sought to show that the shot that killed Fred Barris had not necessarily been fired at close range, as the police had claimed. At the trial, prosecution really relied on him having to have shot round a wall. That simply wasn't true, and his position was crucial. If he'd been in bed, heard a noise, came out in panic and an instant reaction, shot from the stairs, then um, that's a presentation to the jury of self-defence. If he's waiting downstairs lying in ambush, that's something very different indeed. That's revenge. We've been asked to do some tests just to see what effect the shotgun would have. David Dyson is frequently called on by the courts as an expert witness on gunfire. He demonstrated the effects on the human body of shotgun pellets fired from 12 feet away. Now we're going to use a shoulder of pork, which is the closest thing we can get really to human tissue. 12 feet is the estimated distance Tony Martin would have been standing from Fred Barris if he had fired from the top of the stairs. <laughs> The effect is similar to that of a gun being fired from much closer range. It's a common misconception that shotgun pellets spread out dramatically as soon as they leave the barrel. They don't. And, for instance, at 12, 15 feet, you would only get a hole probably of about two inches. The prosecution had also argued that Tony Martin fired repeatedly from the bottom of the stairs, as this was where all three spent cartridges were later found. But as David Dyson showed, using the same gun, there may have been another explanation. A shotgun cartridge could have been fired on the stairs, but retained within the gun. Mr. Martin may then have moved to the bottom of the stairs, and it was that point that he ejected the shotgun cartridge, the spent case that had been fired on the stairs. He then, from that same position, fired two more shots, and the cartridges from those two shots were ejected at that same point. Therefore, you would get one shot fired on the stairs, but three cartridge cases found in the same place. But despite the new questions over the ballistic evidence, the appeal judges decided this was insufficient grounds on which to quash the conviction. If Martin's defence team were to win, they needed more fresh evidence. Their next argument centred on the state of Bleak House at the time of the shooting. The prosecution claimed Martin had fitted it with booby traps designed to ensnare burglars. The prosecution did their best to use his interesting house with the ladders and um, other possible traps to show he was lying in wait. But his house was a mess. A ladder for him was a way to um, walk where others have stairs. Well, it was one of the nails in the coffin about me being an odd bull. They tried to make out that the staircase was a booby trap. The booby trap is something you cannot see. And unfortunately, I turned the staircase around in my house 180 degrees, but like everything I do, I didn't quite finish it off. Tony had been uh, modifying his house for a very, very long time, and I don't set out to speak against him, um, but the truth of the matter was this was DIY gone insane. I I'm afraid it was in such a state that it did mean something. But the appeal evidence that was to prove most significant concerned the state of Tony Martin's mind at the time of the shooting. In a series of interviews conducted by a psychiatrist brought in by the appeal team, a far darker picture began to emerge. So, Tony, tell me something about your personal life. Tell me something about your, your parents, your mum, your dad. I spent quite a few hours trying to interview Mr Martin just the two of us, uh, and found him very difficult to interview. Well, I made two diagnoses. The first was that he was suffering from a personality disorder, and the particular type was a paranoid personality disorder, which he will have suffered from for many years, and it's a developmental problem related primarily to childhood experiences. 
During the interviews, Martin had described how he'd been abused as a child, once by a distant relative and once by a teacher. The experience had made it difficult for him to make normal adult relationships. It had also left him with an abnormal fear of being molested again. One of the biggest arguments we had at the Court of Appeal is when a jury hears about self-defense, they need to know someone's background. So the perception for him and the fear that arose for him as he heard footsteps was different because of his past. In his past, footsteps on the stairs meant someone was coming up to abuse him. So his fear would be much greater than anyone else who knew their house was being invaded. For him, it was even worse. You know, the best way to stop them Shoot the bastards! Blow their heads off! In the months before the incident, he developed a moderately severe depressive illness due partly to serious problems with his physical health, also a previous burglary which had really set him back and made him feel very unsafe. And it was the combination of his personality disorder which made him quite paranoid, plus the depressive illness that intensified his fear about being attacked, burgled and violated in some way, to use his word. It was this evidence that ultimately proved crucial. The appeal has been successful. The conviction of murder has been dropped to one of manslaughter on the grounds of diminished responsibility. The court reduced Martin's sentence, but even after this judgment, he still had another 12 months to serve. Very, very disappointed. I think it's so petty to give him another 12 months. Uh, most of us feel he should never have been in prison in the first place. I knew that most of the people, certainly, that uh, I'd spoken to about Tony Martin had a lot of sympathy. I mean, no one wanted a 16-year-old lad to be killed. Uh, I suppose my view on these things is that you know, if you're going to break into someone's house in the middle of the night and something dreadful happens to you, there's only one person you've really got to blame. That's yourself. But despite the protests from friends and the public, there were those who argued that Martin should have served longer. For the police, the final verdict is still difficult to accept. I'm totally satisfied in, in my own view that the, the actual actions that he committed on the night uh, were those of murder. Uh, by the same token, I think there are other elements in terms of uh, Mr. Martin's uh, personality and demeanour to make representations around diminished responsibility. For others, the fact that Martin never showed remorse for his crime was enough to keep him behind bars for longer. There are some people who said, well, how do you feel about killing a guy? When you're being broken in your house, it's an invasion. You are being invaded. And he said, I was a danger to burglars. But actually, I'm not a danger to burglars walking down the road. It's when they come in through the window. On the 28th of July, 2003, Tony Martin went free, returning to live at the farm where the shooting happened. But he soon learned of another court case, one that threatened the future of his beloved Bleak House. And there was the possibility at one time that he could lose the farm in order to pay the compensation. After serving three years for the manslaughter of a 16-year-old burglar, Tony Martin was released from prison. In retrospect, do you regret ever having that gun illegally? No. Fresh from his cell, he wanted to give his side of the story. I wasn't in the perpetration of crime, everybody knows that. But it was said that if I catch anybody in my house, I shoot him. Actually, it's a metaphor, it's a figure of speech, and everybody uses it. I've even heard women say about their children, you little monkey, I'll kill you. I didn't think it was a bad idea to the state that I was having, and no doubt other people were having, to say something like that, but it got me into a lot of trouble. Rather than returning to obscurity, Tony Martin stayed in the news. He found himself being adopted as a figurehead for those demanding a change to the self-defence laws. 
I think the Tony Martin case lit a touch paper that has led to an explosion of anger and resentment of millions of law-abiding British people who no longer feel that the state is on their side. And it touched a nerve and people, a lot of people who would basically who are busy going to work down their track every day, suddenly start to take notice what's going on in this country. There was a groundswell of opinion, probably before Tony Martin, to try and broaden the defence of self-defence. And therefore that has sort of subsumed his mental health problems and he's been made into a, a bit of an artificial icon and he's probably not the right person to have chosen to champion this particular uh, crusade. Well, I think... He's an icon uh, for the great British public because he did what uh, an awful lot of them would like to do or think they would do if uh, they were in the same position, uh, if they were burgled and they'd got a tool in their hand. But just as interest in the case began to disappear, a familiar figure reappeared. The man who had led the burglary on the night of the fatal shooting decided to sue. Brendan Fearon issued a claim against um, Tony Martin for damages for assault. It had ruined his life, it had ruined his sex life, he couldn't um, get around, he couldn't go to the gym. And there was the possibility at one time that he could lose the farm in order to pay the compensation. And people who are just uh, normal citizens who haven't had any trouble with the law don't know how to manipulate the law to help them to the best of their ability. It is a, a worrying thought that um, someone uh, who's brought it all on themselves, like Fearon, get one day, <laughs> no one forced him to burgle Tony Martin's um, house, uh, that there was a claim uh, which could have succeeded um, otherwise um, for money. To the popular press, Martin was, once again, the real victim, and they were eager to help. I thought, God, we got another hurdle to cross, haven't we? I wasn't very happy about that. And that cost a lot of money, that case did. And I can thank the Sun newspapers for that. The readers in there raised enough money to cover that. These shaky pictures, taken by an undercover cameraman, show a man out walking his dog with no apparent injury. But the Sun newspaper went even further to help. After catching Fearon on camera, riding his bike and seemingly fit and well, his demand for compensation was quietly dropped. In the years since his release, Tony Martin has continued to farm the land surrounding Bleak House. The house is boarded up with um, steel window shutters and nature has taken over its extraordinarily bizarre place with trees and branches growing through the roof. I mean, it looks like something out of a, of a horror movie, a Walt Disney horror movie. You couldn't actually, couldn't get in even if you wanted to now. But the land is something that he really cares about. It's quite interesting because he's no longer a poor man. He owns about 200 acres of land in about six different locations, I believe. And land in Norfolk is quite valuable. But the debate over what constitutes a legitimate response in the protection of your home rages on. It doesn't need alteration of the law. Anyone who knows all the particulars about the case immediately says, well, if we can't really found a new system of law on these facts, you're rather exceptional. But it seems to me that self-defence works in a very reasonable way, and, and the average jury understands it. I think it should be, the balance of probability should be towards the homeowner. Um, but everyone should, every case should be judged individually. You can't have people going round um, uh, killing people just because they're uh, on your property. Although I did discover in the course of um, this case that um, if you shoot a burglar dead in Texas, they give you 5,000 US dollars uh, as a present uh, for having done so. But um, I personally don't support that. Finally, in the 2008 Criminal Justice Act, the government redefined the laws on self-defence to give greater legal protection to those protecting their own property. Many question whether Tony Martin would be prosecuted were the same to happen today. I think they look more carefully now. Tony Martin was that rare creature, a popular defendant. And generally, the public do not want householders prosecuted if they can imagine that they would have acted in precisely the same way themselves. 
the same circumstances. I think it's in. I think it's in. It's all. You are going to do something. You're either going to pick up a hammer. Um, I don't know, knife or whatever. You're going to do something. Sixteen-year-old Fred Barris tragically lost his life as a result of the burglary at Bleak House. Brendan Fearon spent 18 months in prison for his crime. He was approached to take part in this programme, but demanded a fee. We declined. But it is the name of farmer Tony Martin that remains etched on the national consciousness. I'd rather be better known for something else. I'd like, you know, like to be um, Robin Hood in Sherwood Forest, or um, in Scaramouche, or some of those lovely old movies, something like that. To some, he will always be a folk hero. To others, a criminal. In his own eyes, he's returned to being a simple farmer. <sighs> Voila. It is beautiful. It is pure beautiful. <laughs>